Hi, Dragon Con. We're super excited to be here with everyone today. This is uh, the Brit Tracks Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The TV series has turned 40, and we are here to talk about it. Um, I'm super, super, super happy to be with everybody today. I think it's going to be a really strong panel. We're going to talk about why the show has such an appeal why it's been around for as long as it is, might mention a notorious movie, as well as discuss the origins, the cast, the production, and why this show got a BAFTA for uh, animation. So we are going to chit-chat throughout this uh, entire panel with these lovely, wonderful people. My name is Carol. I'm the Brit, Brit Track Director here at Dragon Con. With me, I have my Assistant Director, Rob, in the hat. How are you doing today, Rob? I am spiffing. Thank you very much. In fact, I am hoopy. You're hoopy? I'm hoopy. Okay. All right. That's fair. We also have um, with us as well some other wonderful um, gentlemen that have worked with us over the past few years. We have Keith R.A. DeCanado. He is an author, editor, critic, musician, mar martial artist, publisher, and massive British science fiction Fan Goober, even ever since he stumbled across Doctor Who reruns at age eight. How are you doing, Keith? I'm pretty good, and I'm fairly certain I know where my towel is. So. You do? Okay, good. That's very, very, very important. Yes. Um, we, <laughs> we also have with us Rob Levy, who's been with us for a super long time, and we're so glad he's here. He is a member of the Weekend Justice podcast, writer for Anglotopia. Net, needcoffee.com, and a contributing writer for several anthologies. How are you doing today, Levy? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Yay. Uh, we also have with us Nathan. Nathan is um, a wonderful, wonderful a guest. He is the host of the 42 cast, which is your ultimate answer to fandom, geekiness, and everything, where he and a rotating cast talk about every and any topic in genre media. How are you doing today, Nathan? I'm feeling mostly harmless. <laughs> ah, well played. Oh, that's well played. <laughs> well played. And then we have with us today also, um, all the way from Canada, Brian. And Brian is from British, the British Invaders podcast, uh, which has been around for a really long time, which is a podcast all about British science fiction and television. Um, how are you doing this evening? Well, what is it? What time is it there? <laughs> I don't know. I never could get the hang of Thursdays. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's hilarious. So, um, Douglas Adams, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It has been a part of the uh, universal consciousness for as long as it possibly can. And it is 40 years as a TV series, and it aired in 1981. Um, and it started off as a radio series and went on to... Um, be a production in of sorts. It took a couple of years for them to, to get it just right. And um, we're super like just fans, all of us are, of this wonderful show. And the first thing I kind of want to talk about is the basis in the in radio. Does anybody want to jump in and talk about like where that came from? What, what was the whole kind of deal behind the jump from radio to television? Well, um, it started out, that, that's simply where um, Adams was able to produce it. He was he was working for uh, the BBC in a variety of capacities, uh, and he originally envisioned it as a radio drama, um, and that's, that's simply how it was produced. It was incredibly popular. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. It was then, uh, actually, the, the, the novel... The first novel, uh, novel adaptation of the radio drama, came first after the radio drama, um, before the TV show, even though the TV show was actually adapting the radio drama. Um, but uh, it was it was hugely successful uh, on the radio, and um, uh, there was there was a great deal of interest in adapting it to other media where it would get more exposure, both literary and television. And then later there were. Um, uh, comic books and video and, and video text text based video games and, and all sorts of other fun stuff. Um, but the, the radio drama was, was where it started and, and arguably was the form where it was best. Um, and we can probably argue about that at some point during this hour, but, um, <laughs> but the, the, the TV show pretty much took the, the first of the radio. There were, there were a couple of different uh, radio dramas that were done um, and the TV show adapted the first of them, which was then later made up the first half of, the first book and the second half of the second book 
when he adapted it into prose form. What's what's interesting to me about Hitchhiker's Guide is that it's probably weirdly most of the time when something is in multiple media, the screen version of it is the one that's best known. Um, for the most part, with Hitchhikers, it's actually it's usually the books that are that people know them as more than anything, even mm -hmm. more so than the television show. Despite how wonderful the TV show and the radio show were, absolutely, well, absolutely. Well, I was just going to say, like, growing it. up in the States, yeah. you know, I mean, the books were the, something that were easily accessible to me, sure. and that's, you know, something that was easy for me to read, whereas I know that some PBS stations showed the series, but mm -hmm. since it was just a six-episode series, if you weren't the right age at the right time when it was airing on PBS, you never saw it. And so, mm -hmm. and then, and then the radio, I mean, radio is dead in America, right? I mean, as far <laughs> as, like, dramas, like, you, we don't get radio shows here, so, you know. <laughs> was it 19? 78 right yeah yeah so i mean it's it's that's that's why the books i think for americans at least is usually the intro uh brian you're gonna say something yeah in the uk it's often not always but often the radio series that's better known mm -hmm. because it had such a big showing at the beginning and not only did people listen to it on initial broadcast but a lot of people ended up taping it and sharing tapes mm -hmm. so there was a sort of groundswell of support that built up after the fact as it circulated through that's how i found it the yeah. university campuses and that sort of thing mm -hmm. and Robin, mm -hmm. you know that sort of led to well this is so well known that publishers wanted a book of it and that sort of thing mm -hmm. robin um, the hat uh, the the little bit of britain that we have here in america uh, npr actually did play the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy radio series, at least fit the first here in America back in that day. Uh, yeah. I didn't, I wasn't able to listen to it then, uh, yeah. but uh, the, it was, it was aired over here in America. It wasn't, it wasn't NPR. It was, it was, they may have aired it also. The first to air was actually uh, WBAI, which was Pacifica Radio uh, really? in New York. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. All right, um, Jim, Jim, Freund, Jim Freund did that. He's, he, it's something he takes immense pride in and... <laughs> Yeah, it kind of made its way through, you know, cassette. Like, I found it through bootleg cassette. And right. then it ended up on the local college radio station. Like, a lot of college radio stations yeah. that didn't have any late-night programming would run it. And then um, I was really happy it, in the same way that you would hear, like, a, a bootleg of your favorite band and the, and the vocals were scratchy or whatever. I happened to cross the record because they were very yes. smart, and they released it as a record. That, um, it was a different version. It wasn't quite the but, same as the radio version. No, but it's still <laughs> there's too many versions. <laughs> but still, there's so many people I know that were like not reading book people in 1983 yeah. that were like, "Oh my god, it's a record," you know. And the fact that like they were smart enough to put it in independent. I mean, they got they got a lot of college radio play on it. So then mm -hmm. they followed that up with getting it in indie record stores. So like. I remember going and seeing it like on display, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy next to a jam record and like a clash record, right? <laughs> so they were very smart in how they made it underground here and then took it mainstream with the books. But um, it's, it's really interesting because unlike a lot of other fandoms, it's grassroots history is just incredibly cool. It's really, yeah. really interesting, yeah. That's totally, totally true. So I want to kind of like challenge you guys because Hitchhiker's Guide is, you know, a five part trilogy. And um, I just want to uh, see, let's see if we could try this here in about two sentences <laughs> with as little conjunctions as possible. <laughs> uh, how would you describe to people who have are not familiar with Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Like, what's the premise of this? Um, let's start off with Rob in the Hat. What's your premise, your brief premise? An Earthman scours the galaxy for a cup of tea. Okay, all right. Keith, what about you? Um, the world blows up, and that's where the story starts. Okay, all right. Levy? An everyday man ponders his role in the universe, then finds himself in it, pondering what the hell to do next. Okay, Nathan? Um, it's a celebration of the absurd, and no. it is well lethal done. nihilism. Ah, nice. Okay. Well done. Nice. Brian? 
meandering through what's left after the world is destroyed. <laughs> okay. So That's the one thing. We, we were talking before about how he changed it on the record. Every single version of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy has been slightly different from every other version. Mm-hmm. But the one consistency is that it always starts with the Earth blowing up. Yes. That's always the start of the story. Where it goes from there varies from version to version. Mm-hmm. But... And Douglas Adams specifically wanted to do it that way. He specifically wanted to have different versions for different media that would do slightly different things. Mm-hmm. And I know in the the one the preface for one of the editions he of the books he wrote that he wanted to set the record straight or at least set the record firmly crooked. <laughs> and, right. and I, I think that sums it up for uh, what he was doing with that. It was okay for them all to vary. That made it better in his view, and I think that worked. Well, I think there's a certain, like, beyond the fact of the author trying to perfect the story, there's also a certain, like, monetary wisdom there too, right? Because yeah. mm-hmm. now the fans, you have to collect every version to get <laughs> every aspect of the story. So, I mean, it's, I think that's Adams being very smart. Oh, it's also yeah. he can kind of it's it's like jazz. He can kind of riff off of it based on the new thing that he comes up with, and mm-hmm. it's brilliant because in fiction that doesn't um, doesn't really particularly happen much. So his timing yeah. for doing that was like really really groundbreaking. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And so, um, what? Let, let's go around and, and kind of uh, I want to hear your thoughts on this. What makes this show, the TV show specifically, the iteration of the TV show? so unique and special it's it's been around for 40 years we had a blu-ray come out um and like what makes the show special so let's start off with um brian well for the tv show specifically i'll say it's the guide entries and the animation of the guide entries which are sort of a unique form of storytelling. It's like a medium of storytelling that you don't really see elsewhere, where you have about two to three things going on at a time, at least. And you have the text of what the narrator is saying being displayed on screen, but out of, but out of sync with, the, with uh, how the narrator is saying it. And at the same time, you have other bits of text saying other things, and you have uh, visual graphics as well. And they're coordinating with each other, but all doing slightly different things, slightly out of time. And it can take, you know, sometimes a number of viewings to really catch everything that's happening in those. Right. Okay, Robin the Hat. Um, I would have to say that uh, it is uh, the interaction of the actors. Now, they brought uh, quite a few of the actors from the radio series over to the television series. Peter Jones, Simon Jones, Mark Wing Davey, uh, all reprised their roles for the television series, but they went the extra mile because, I mean, yes, in, in, act, in, in radio, you, you really have to act, and a lot of times you have to overact because people can't see your face. But um, in the television series, you got to see Arthur Dent in his tatty robe. You got to see uh, Mark Green Davy with his two heads and three hands, which in the radio show was just a, a throwaway, but you actually got to see it. Not very well, mind you, but you did get to see it. Plus, I love uh, David Dixon as Ford Prefect. Whenever I read the books, mm-hmm. now, that's the version of the character that I see. Okay. All right, Keith. I'm going to disagree with Rob about um, the, the the two heads and the three arms because I think that worked better in radio um, <laughs> I, because it was it was you get there were the, and that was one of there were several elements of it that worked better in radio because you could you just have that throwaway line of dialogue and that sets your brain going and and the different visual things um, but what the TV show did do very well was provide um, besides uh, the what what Brian mentioned about the guide entries which was superb. Um, Simon Jones was so perfect as Arthur Dent, partly because of his voice, mainly because of his voice. That, that, that was what, how he, he brought the character to life originally in radio. But his hangdog facial expressions that you don't get in radio and you absolutely get, and that's what makes the whole thing work, is, is his, you know, just, the, he's, he's, got, he's very subtle. I mean, I remember him in, uh, in Brideshead Revisited also, where he was playing a very, you know, Priggish, uh, straight 
straight laced uh, uh, rich asshole basically, mm -hmm. and he, uh, and and it just the, the subtle variations in his face were just so good, and and you really got a good feel for that in in the TV show. Okay, all right, Levy. Yeah, a lot of that. I mean, a lot of it's really nuanced, and you know, like you have poor Mark Wayne Davy, this great classically trained actor with like this awful dull head that I mean yes I realize Doctor Who fans are complaining about special effects um, but it, like you know I, despite the fact that the theater of the mind of radio is like the best thing possible mm -hmm. it somehow translated from the radio over just almost seamlessly which a lot of stuff doesn't do you're watching it and you're like okay I know what's gonna happen next I know it's gonna happen, but you're still like you don't care and I think the biggest testament to it for me is that you know I can always watch it um, visually and, you know, I mean, it's still funny. It's still visually interesting. And the way that I, I love the format of it. I know we've talked about that a little bit, but I just sort of love the whole way that it unspools and the it's taking radio and turning it into TV is much harder than it looks. And the fact that they did it and they didn't really miss a beat is great. But I think the nice thing about it is, at least here in St. Louis, Hitchhikers, they ran it before Doctor Who and after Blake 7, um, <laughs> right? So the fact that, it, you know, it was something that wasn't a genre show in the traditional sense um, warmed people over so people could come to it new, completely unaware that these other exist, other versions existed. And then also people that have read the book or that or people are familiar with the radio play, I mean, or eventually got a hold of the book and they saw it later on the repeats, it didn't matter. It's it's got this like bulletproof kind of Teflon thing going for it that like mm -hmm. the flaws the things that I like about the radio show that I don't like about the TV I completely overlook when I watch it because it's great it's so fun and entertaining and it's um, uh, you know like Nathan said it's completely nihilistic but you don't think of that while you're watching it it's just bonkers it is bonkers fun and if you can't like it I don't think you're human. That's fair. Okay. All right, Nathan, what about you? Why is this show so special, the TV series? Well, I think Keith took uh, my comments about Arthur because, uh, you know, that's why I was going to bring that up because, you Are know, you um, a, a lesser actor, I think, would have tried to ham Arthur up, and, and he doesn't at all. He plays it completely straight, which is what you need. You need Arthur mm -hmm. to be completely deadpan, completely serious about everything he says, because the other characters provide the humor, and that's great. That's what makes it funny. And so I really appreciate that. But as someone who grew up on Doctor Who, okay, there is nothing that makes me smile more than listening to that 81 synthesizer radiophonic yes. music. <laughs> it makes me think of Legopolis and, you know, all those like season 18 stories. And, and I'm like, yeah. oh man, yeah, this is like, this and is, they're in it you know, I didn't see the, the show in yeah. 15 yes. Yes. years ago. Yeah. I, I grew yeah. up watching Doctor Who though. So, um, you know, it, it always gives me kind of flashbacks to that Doctor Who stuff. And honestly, Marvin is perfect. That yes. prop for Marvin, because that's the thing. Like, even though I love Alan Rickman's voice in the movie version, that like how they realized Marvin physically mm -hmm. never yeah. worked for me. That yeah. like thing that looks like it's out of the trash heap and has that like really depressed expression on its face, it is so good. And my wife, who's never read the books, has no knowledge of everything, anything hitchhikers, you know, watch the series with me though. And she loves Marvin. She thinks Marvin is like the yeah. greatest thing ever. And that's exactly why, because you get that great attitude, you know, from the voice acting, but also that prop is yeah. just perfect. Yeah. And, awesome. and, I, and I think too, to a lesser extent, the same with deep thought. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. The way the yes. voice sort of resonates with that. It's nowhere as effective as Marvin, but you know, you have these like rich British voices that instead of being in the foreground, are in the background kind of side player things and it really pushes everything else to the front in a way that just really works. Peter Davison's uh, pig was more effective in the in the in the TV show too. The pig who, who yes. points out the different parts. <laughs> the day. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's so yeah. True. Valentine so, Dial is deep thought though. Oh so oh my God. Yeah. yes. <laughs> It's yes, the really... Black Guardian is deep thought. Absolutely. <laughs> what's, what's, what's great is that that is the job that he got the most money for ever. Really? Working. Really? And he always sure. he, he did this. I watched this interview with him where he was on TV and he's like, 
I went to RADA. I did all this theater during the war and I've done all of this really serious work and this is what I've known for, you know? <laughs> and they were actually worried because he was like, the, of all the actors, he was the, sort of like the straightest, most rigid, you know, I'm a, I'm a thespian. Th and apparently he was like hilarious. Um, <laughs> So I think I think the ability to take these like really serious people and just sort of almost defrock them and let them let them have some air really works. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely, yeah. and, and so, Nathan's totally right about Marvin. He's totally right yeah, about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a fair point. So um, for people who are are new, like they may have read the the books, they probably haven't really dipped their toe into the radio drama. They might have seen the two. What is it, two thousand five? Film that came out. Um, I'm what? Sorry. In, what? <laughs> hey, I like that movie. I'm like, the only one. But yeah. <laughs> what is the appeal for new fans to watch the show now after forty years? So, is it the production? Is it the producing? The writing? The actors? The special guests? Because we do know that, for example, Douglas Adams makes it, um, five appearances in the <laughs> series. So, uh, what would be like? Why do you think that they should they should view it as far as like what are they going to get out of it if they're a fan of the novels? Let's go around. Let's start off with Levy. Um, well, everything in the eighties is retro now, and you know the the synth a lot of the synth music that they used both on the sorry to do this to you, Nathan. Um, a lot of the stuff that they brought up because he brought that up, and it's a great point. A lot of the stuff they used in the TV show and on the radio show that does not sound completely unfamiliar and out of place today. In a lot of in a lot of music, and then um, I also think too that it's those graphics, even though they're dated, right? They still hold up really well. And mm -hmm. the fact that I think Brian, you mentioned, there's two or three things going on at once, and it totally works. And I think that's part of it. But I also think there is sort of this like <sighs> charm to it. There's this like this like sort of sense of like. Everyone has these these moments in their life where they're dealing with bureaucracy or just heavy-handed like stuff they don't have to deal with. And this, no matter who you are, you get a break from that. And I think a lot of its messages and the things that it pokes fun at still work. So I think it's got that, but I also think it's got the nostalgia. I also think it's got um, a certain amount of cachet to it now where people are like well i don't know i they may never have seen the show they may know nothing about it but if you at least say what if you at least say hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy 40 years now they know it's something so it mm -hmm. is a pop culture moment that even people that are unfamiliar with it will at least sort of say oh i've heard of that that's fair that's a great point um nathan uh yeah so i mean stated another way i think the the humor is timeless i yeah. mean adam's uh, is brilliant, you know, uh, in his writing. And, you know, a lot of the jokes, they still land because they're not jokes about anything specific in time, right? They're, they're mm -hmm. the kinds of jokes about bureaucracy, about like the sort of senselessness of the things that we do and all that kind of stuff and, and the whys and the questions we ask about the universe. I mean, the thing about the philosophers not wanting to have any established facts, yeah. but then saying, wait a minute, you can make a ton of money you know, like just like speculating for all the years it's going to take for the fact, you know, for the for the answer to be said, you know, mm -hmm. and stuff, just stuff like that. I mean, it's like that's timeless. Right. I mean, that that doesn't change in the 80s versus now. So yeah. um, there's that. And I think I think really for, for specifically about the TV version and, and the original radio version, this is the perfect ending. I, I've yeah. always felt kind of like as the story continued, I was kind of like, oh, but you you it was such a perfect ending you know, originally. And, and I feel like if you're just watching the TV show, you're not familiar with any of the other mer uh, media. This is a great, that's a great place to leave it. Like the, the whole, the whole thing comes full circle. You find out everything that's gone on. It's been completely pointless and that's the joke and you laugh about it. And so I think that's also a uh, part of the genius of this story. Okay. All right. Robin. Huh? Um, I would just have to say the charm. I mean, uh, kind of piggybacking on what everyone else said, you know, Simon Pegg, uh, Simon Jones, sorry, is <laughs> spot on perfect as Arthur Dent. Uh, he just looks confused. The, like, like he just wandered onto the set one day and they just threw a robe at him and said, here you go. And he just, it looks like he has absolutely no idea what's going on. Uh, yeah, um, 
like I said, David Dixon, Mark Green Davies, Sandra Dickinson, they all play their roles to perfection. You know, uh, Sandra Dickinson is is brilliant. Uh, uh, Mark Green Davy is insane. Uh, David Dixon is slightly less insane, but kind of you know, world savvy. Uh, and oh God, Marvin, I every time I, I wake up and I'm just not in the mood. Uh, I, I am Marvin. I think he's very, very depressed. And I try to emulate you. his face. <laughs> I try to emulate his face with my face. So, so yeah, it's just charming. It's one of those shows that yeah. you can either watch or you can have in the background just for noise, but you would never get tired of it. I, I love the Marvin, I love you pop single. It was just so yes. stupidly great that it was amazing. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Keith, what about you? Um, my answer is similar to Nathan's, but it's slightly more specific. The mm. the wordplay is timeless. The it's it's the same reason why you can still watch, for example, Casablanca now or watch MASH now. Um, it's it's a type of humor that specifically relates to language and wordplay and plays on words and, and stuff like that. And that's the sort of humor that, that ages well. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, the, the, like the line, you know, it's very unpleasantly like being drunk. What's wrong with being drunk? Ask a glass of water. That, <laughs> that stays funny. <laughs> um, it's, it's not that tied to me a such a long time to figure out. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's such a long time to figure out. <laughs> um, and, you know, and, 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 I wish I'd listened to what my mother had said when I was younger. What did she say? I don't know. I, don't I wasn't know. listening. <laughs> um, that's that, that's those lines are are still funny, and um, that, and I also agree with what what Nathan said. The 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 ending where they pull the random uh, uh, letters out of the out of the bag um, mm-hmm. <laughs> and and discover what the what the question that the answer to which is forty two is the perfect ending. Um, yeah. it, was, it was actually my biggest disappointment with. The books is that there really wasn't anywhere to go from there, and the third, fourth, and fifth books can prove that in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point, Brian. What about you? Yeah, to elaborate on some of what's been said and what Keith was saying about the wordplay and so on, the wit in it and the even philosophy in a way, but the the humor there, if you know it from the books. It's something you have to hear spoken. Yeah. It works when delivered by the right actors. It adds so much more than what you have on the on the page. So I would say, you know, just hearing that and hearing, uh, you know, Peter Jones as the boy as the voice of the book. Yeah, yeah. you can't read it and and you know have what he's giving you unless you've heard that. I mean, I know for myself, I had seen the show before I had read the books. Mm. Um, when I was younger, I lived in England. When I was 12, my dad was stationed there. And we you know, visited and we would scroll through TV and it just happened to be on. And we watched it and I was like, oh, it's a book. I want to read it and picked it up. And I that's his voice. Like, I can't get... Mm-hmm his voice out of my head when I read it, even when I read, try to listen to like an audio book version of Hitchhiker's Guide, a more modern one. It's just the, the person isn't right. You know, they just don't sound right because of the TV shows. That's how much impact, you know, it can have on you. So if you are a fan of the books, I think that, you know, you'd absolutely, you know, and in fact, love it. When, when they did the, the movie, uh, you know, Simon Jones had, had been uh, gone for a while, but I feel they found the only actor who could have done yeah. that role justice yeah. and was Stephen Fry, because he mm-hmm. has such a yeah. melodious tone. Peter Jones, not Simon Jones. Uh, uh, Peter, Peter Jones, Jones. Yes. yes, sorry, yeah. Simon um, Jones was actually in the movie, so he was. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Peter Jones. Uh, but, uh, oh, yeah, Fry um, was perfect. Fry has such a melodious uh, yeah. tone to his voice that mm-hmm. uh, he, he was the only other person who could have Taking that over from Peter Jones. What, whatever, whatever one thinks of the movie, and I know I'm I'm pretty much alone in actually liking it. Um, the 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 casting of the voice only roles was perfect throughout. Stephen mm-hmm. Fry and Helen Mirren and and Alan Rickman were fantastic mm-hmm. and and really excellent uh, uh, successors to to the folks who did it. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, especially uh, like Rob said, uh, Fry Fry absolutely nailed. The voice of the guide. Um, Absolutely. And so I mean, like, 
it's worth noting that the guide entries were there and were done in that way because it was a radio program originally. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was a way of having a narrator and making it not and transitions just be a narrator. Scenes. Yeah. 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 And, you know, you sort of lose that a bit when you're reading it from the books, but that's really what it was about. And, like, the Zaphod having three arms and two heads as a throwaway joke, that's a classic radio comedy thing to put in a throwaway that changes the description of someone. Yes. So it really does have the hallmarks of coming from there. Absolutely. And so, you know, I mean, getting into the comparison, you know, um, between the, the film and the TV show, um, do we think that there were some missteps? Do we feel like it was, a, it was a good success? Like, how do we feel about the transition from TV and the comparison to the, to the 2005 film? Let's start off with Robin the Hat. Um, well, uh, Keith may be thinking that he's the only one who enjoyed the movie, but I enjoyed the movie too. I feel like um, uh, 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 <laughs> now I'm with you there. Um, but you you kind of have to take it as this is a different version, which anyone who's a fan of Hitchhikers uh, will, will realize. You know, because like I uh, said earlier, the the books were different from the radio series. The radio series is different from the television series. The uh, the text game uh, just <laughs> ended hella early. Uh, mm -hmm. from uh, everything else. And then the, the movie was purposely made different from the television series, but it called back to it in some very clever ways, like the fact of Simon Jones having a cameo mm -hmm. in the movie. That's a good so point. You, and you Marvin has to... a cameo as well. Yes, he does. Yes, yes in the yeah. queue. Yes, he does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, Nathan, what about you? Okay, so this is where uh, the fact that I haven't read the books in like 20 years and I, I you know, it's, <laughs> my, my right. memories are dim and I and unfortunately have never heard the radio show. Um, but uh, as, really far as, as far as uh, adaptations go, I mean, for me, to me, since we're talking about the movie now and we're bringing that up, to me, the sin of the movie is that it's not funny. Like, you know, like, that's the problem is like, I, it's, it, it's more that sort of, it's more like sort of like a little kid humor. And it's not like the sort of like wordplay, like we talked about and all that. I mean, some of it is kept and whatnot, mm -hmm. but they downplayed a lot of the, like the, the more intelligent cerebral humor in the movie and made it more like a slapsticky thing and, and more of that kind of stuff. And, you know, I haven't seen it since it first came out. I, I watched it in the movie theater because it's Hitchhiker's Guide for the, you know, to the Galaxy. I wanted to see it. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I've never seen it since. Um, but as far as the translation from the books to the show or from the show to the books or however you want to say, mm -hmm. you know, where the connective tissue is, um, you know, I, I remember, you know, at least feeling like the TV show and the first two books are very, you know, are very congruent. Obviously some things have moved around, some things have mm -hmm. changed, but I never felt like there was a big disjoint between those. Like, I feel like the movie is between the you know the tv shows and the books right that's that's completely fair levy um he nailed it pretty much um <laughs> so i think you know for me the best part is the divine comedy neil hannah and so long and thanks for all the fish song that like will not leave your head 20 years later um <laughs> i i still think that's great and i think that it fall it makes the fatal sin that they make when they try to adapt British things for American audiences and that they just, mm -hmm. the people that are doing the adaptation don't necessarily understand the work. Right. Yeah. I mean, we, we talked about Rickman. We talked about Helen Mirren, you know, those are people that, and, and Fry, they sort of get what the book means from a cultural legacy standpoint and from a humor standpoint and a performer standpoint. Whereas I don't necessarily think the other people that came in got it. Um, and it's, it's a little too choppy. I don't hate it. I mean, I don't, I don't look upon it as like, this never should have been made. Oh my God, it's horrible. Um, mm -hmm. I've only seen it twice and it's been forever, but I, I, I didn't leave the theater shaking my fist at it going, Oh my God, it's horrible. It's just, it would, it's different and it's not necessarily what I wanted it to be, but that doesn't necessarily make it bad. I know that's kind of a weird right. answer, but no, that's an appropriate answer for this panel. And uh, all right. Um, Brian, I don't think you've gone yet. Yeah, I didn't think it was horrible, but it felt sort of clumsy to me. It didn't uh, do the plot very well, and it didn't do the 
sort of meandering sense of it very well, which uh, I think part of the issue was that uh, the Adams-esque way of doing things is very much sort of following around and looking out the window and seeing what's going on. And that isn't really how American films are made at that point. So it felt like a bit of a mismatch. And that was sort of the case with the humor as well. Okay. All right, Keith? Um, I think the biggest problem with it is that the story isn't really suited to the limited storytelling space that a movie has. Mm -hmm. um, every other version of it has more room to breathe. Um, you know, the, the, the TV show was six, was, you know, in essence, six hours long, um, or six episodes long, at least. Um, the, the, the books, you know, go on forever. The radio drama was, was multiple parts. It all, they all had space to breathe. And, and it's it's really hard, as Brian said, to do the meandering in when you've only got a couple hours to tell your story. Having said that, um, you know I still enjoyed the hell out of it. It added things to the mythos, like "So Long and Thanks for All the Fish," which I, honestly the movie was worth making just for that song because that's like the mm -hmm. perfect song um, and and such a magnificent earworm. Um, and uh, and getting to hear Alan Rickman be Marvin the Martian and, and Stephen Fry do the book and Helen Mirren and and. And for that matter, Bill Nye is Slaughter Bartfast, who was born. Oh my God! Yeah. Yes. Um, right. No, I would agree with that one. That was, I mean, was uh, Martin death. Freeman is one of the few people who I thought was worthy to succeed Simon Jones in that role. He absolutely mm -hmm. nailed that frumpy, downtrodden. Um, oh my God! Can somebody please get me a cup of tea? Thing that <laughs> that Simon Jones did so well that 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 dumpy white guy look <laughs> that. Right. that both of them do so well, and that the part of Arthur Dent really requires. Absolutely. And, and the Bogons were superb. Yeah, the I Bogons mean... were absolutely superb in that movie. I really, personally, I liked the film. Um, I did... A pre I do prefer the television series um, as far as a choice between the two, personally. Um, I feel like you get more of that, like, a, like journey and quest-like aspects of seeking and 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 it's just all like just falling apart and then put back together and then falling apart again you get that in the television series and i didn't necessarily feel like that the movie did that to an extent um and i felt like you know it was great to see the vogons if they were it was my favorite part of the entire entire movie was the all the bits with the vogons but i felt like they were so so minor you know, that now they're just, they almost are played up as the big bad of the movie to an extent. And that I had, a, I struggled with, I had a, a challenge with. So I have like a love hate relationship with <laughs> the movie. I love bits and pieces of it, but as a whole, you know, again, like the ending of the TV series, you finally, you get the the question, right? You get this at the very end, um, the you have the answer and you get the question and the way that it ends is just beautiful and they completely remove that, right, from, from yeah. the film. So that was a little bit of a letdown. <laughs> I was waiting for it and like not, not happy about it. So I can definitely see that we're all, we have mixed reviews appropriately of the film. <laughs> you know, um, I think that leads into uh, a conversation I was having earlier about how mm -hmm. Uh, American audiences expect a hero. Mm -hmm. uh, British audiences don't expect don't expect to win every time. Uh, and uh, uh, while you might you may say being alive is a success, um, Fort and Arthur in the television series they aren't really doing well. They're trapped <laughs> two million years yeah. in the past with frankly a bunch of idiots, right? Who are going to a bunch of useless Earth. bloody loonies? Yes. Uh, which is my favorite part of the television series, by the way. Watch them interact. With oh, them. yeah. Finding out that the computer program's been screwed up from the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> and then the question doesn't even make sense. What's nine times six? Well, that's not 42. That's 54. Yeah. So that means that even even Arthur doesn't have the answer. He doesn't have the question yeah. because he's part of a corrupted computer program. So the whole thing's been pointless. That's mm. what I love about that ending. It, it's yeah. all been pointless. Yeah, and it's there pointless. must be something wrong with the universe. It's all, right. Yeah, and it's left out. It's completely left out. And you know, the, it this the show has this. Just I love 
various different aspects about the show. But if I had to choose my top two, and, and this is going to be my next question for everybody, my top two specifically um, are the opening, the opening sequence. Like mm. I love the opening sequence. It's nostal- It's it's got the, uh, close to my heartstrings. It's nostalgic for me. It's just as special as like the James Bond openings as the opening to Doctor Who. Like it, I just love it. I think it's great. I love the music with it. It gets stuck How in my head. How does that opening go, Carol? How does that? Open? What are the <laughs> Not going to say. So <laughs> I love that. I'll, it'll get stuck in my head. And then I also love Sandra. I think that she's mm. amazing. What I what I find interesting about her uh, about her playing Trillian is that originally they wanted her to do a different kind of accent, and they had screen tested her with regional accents to find one. And the director got so frustrated. He's like, because she kept when they were filming, she kept flexing between multiple what like styles that he just said, just talk like yourself, just, just speak like yourself. Because the way that she's described in the book is, is not the way that Sandra looks at all. And, um, but I just felt like it's her, like this is, this is Trillian. And so I know those are my two favorite things about um, the TV series. So let's, let's go around. What are your two top two? Like, Favorite things about the TV series that you're like, you need to catch this. This is really great. You're going to love it. Let's start off with Brian. Uh, so one is going to be guide entries, especially the Babel fish guide entry. Mm-hmm. And uh, the other, I will say the uh, Ford and Arthur interactions through the opening section while they're still on earth. Okay. Nathan. Ah, you're making me pick two, which makes it really, really <laughs> <I know>. hard. <laughs> well, it's 42, so two. I can't give you uh, no, 42, I mean, but I can uh, give you two. <laughs> I mean, I guess I'm going to go, because because it does have such a strong, like, sort of visceral reaction from me specifically. For me, it's got to be the background music. That music just <sighs> makes me so happy. It's ridiculous, but I love it. Um and I guess, uh, I mean, uh, I guess it's the ending again. I mean, I need to have that as the ending if you're going to adapt it, Chikers. So, I mean, that's 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 important to me. All right, Rob with the hat. Um, well, I know I said the Gogo Frenchians, but uh, my two favorite things in the entire thing are uh, the two philosophers arguing. Um, and I also can't believe no one said this yet, the dish of the day. Oh yeah! I love the dish of the day, and when you realize, uh, if you ever do any reading, who the dish of the day is, that he's actually the fifth Doctor, Sandra Dickinson's husband. Yeah, that it just it just blows your mind. Yeah, I would never in a million years know that if I hadn't already known it before watching the show that that was a thing. Because I had so steeped in Doctor Who information that I already knew that Peter Davison was in it and what role he was playing. All right. Okay, Keith, what about you? Well, if Rob had just been patient, he would have heard somebody say Dish of the Day because that's one of my (laughs) favorite. I was praying I was going to be able to say it. And (laughs) I actually got to see Peter Davison at a convention ages ago where he actually did the whole routine while during, in the middle of his Q&A completely oh, off the top of his head. Yeah, he did that here too, yeah. It was phenomenal. Um, and I had actually, I this I was like 12 years old. I still hadn't, compl- like I didn't realize that. I had seen Hitchhikers but did not realize he was the pig. I had somehow mm. missed that. I had not assimilated that particular fact until I saw him at the convention. And I was like, I got to go back and watch this now. <laughs> um, now that I know Fair. it's him. The other one uh, is, uh, I'm going to steal uh, Brian's, basically, the, the interactions between Ford and Arthur, starting from the very beginning all the way up until they're uh, snatched by the Heart of Gold. The two mm. of them, the, the, the double act of the two of them is, is the mm. heart and soul of the entire storyline. Um, and, it, and it comes together very nicely at the very end. Um, but uh, but those, those, that whole sequence from the, the drunk line to the, the I can never get the hang of Thursdays, to uh, I don't know I wasn't listening, um, all the way up to you know, in you know, in thirty more in thirty more seconds, um, 
they would have died. And says, See, so if he just hadn't made a decision, mm-hmm. the problem would have been solved, which is Zaphod's entire philosophy. Right, right. And then the ship brings him aboard, and he's yelling at her, and she's, that's not that's not the case. It was the ship's fault. Yep. Um, okay, all right, Levy, what about you? You know, we had um, Peter and Sandra at a convention in St. Louis. It was right after they had their, their baby. And they someone had a VHS tape of it and they were doing it's the earliest earliest sort of rolling monologue I remember people doing stuff while it was going and I really wish Davison would have recorded half of it because just like half the stuff he said that they did I'm like I'm never going to remember this and I don't but I remember it was all funny um I, I not only do I love the music, I love how they place it. It's a very great lesson in how music places. Like at the end of the theme, when you get that right at the end, it's a great lead-in for a visual effect for a show. I mean, mm-hmm. it's just the way they the way they framed it with the music. I love that. Um, I love the conversations between Lunkwell and Deep Thought. It's like mm-hmm. you know, you're really not going to like because you you know you have this you know, deep deep thoughts like this really powerful computer and you think of it you know in your head he's this like omnipotent sort of like Patrick Stewart esque kind of like being right and you're not going to like it really you are and it, it sort of breaks the character that you've established so they have all these moments where you have these characters and they act a certain way that they break them all so I love that I love the philosophy this is getting needlessly messianic yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. And it's you know I think too the the great thing about it is that opening scene in the pub is just so perfect. It's one of the best setups of a of TV, and I don't want to say TV comedy because it's not Hitchhikers isn't comedy and it's not necessarily sci fi kind of. I mean it is, but it isn't. That opening like scene in that pub leading up to him you know going into space is just so well executed. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of timing, not only the acting and the mannerism stuff, but just in terms of the timing. Mm-hmm. I love how with Hitchhikers, you can watch it with the sound down, and it's a masterclass in timing. Um, so, That's a great point. Yeah. And, and we do know that, um, you know, there's a remake coming from Hulu and Disney out. So we are getting a remake. Um, based just on that, what events do you think should be kept from the original, from the TV show? Um, and then what would you add from the novels? Well, so, I think the planet needs to explode per, first. And then after okay. that, it's its own thing. It almost doesn't matter. After that. Yeah. Okay. okay. I stole okay. that from Peter. Yeah. <laughs> all right hold on in all sincerity like what would you be like I, it's in the novels i want to see it on you know this new show or what from the tv series are you like you have to have it do it right like we need it so let's go to keith first i think uh, i would love to see just because we're at the point where where special effects technology can realize it better uh the bit where he figures out how to fly by basically throwing yourself at the ground and missing which I always, I always love that idea, and that that's never been done in any of the dramatizations. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Like Rob said, you've got to keep the Earth exploding at the beginning to make way for a hyperspace bypass because, duh. Um, got to build bypasses. Ult- ultimately, though, what what's going to matter more than anything um, is because it, it's going to vary from the original to some extent or other. What's really going to matter is the casting, and mm-hmm. and and. I forget who said it, but somebody said earlier about, I think it may have been uh, Levy, that they, they did, it has to be made by people who understand British humor. <laughs> uh, because if it, it, it is a very British style of humor, and even if it's going to be marketed for an American audience, it really needs to have that Anglophilic sensibility, for lack of a better word, especially since I'm pretty sure I made that word up. Um, but uh, it needs that more than anything. Okay. Okay, Brian, what about you? I would sort of add to that and say direction. It needs to be you know, directed in a, a way that uses the, uh, the humor, uses some of what was there in the original. I wouldn't mind seeing some of the things from the second radio series, which hasn't Ooh. really been used in anything else. I wouldn't mind seeing some of those bits making it in. Okay. You want to see a lintilla? Possibly. Okay. All right, Nathan. What about you? 
Yeah, I mean, depending on how much they're planning on adapting, I mean, Keith kind of took what I was going to mention, which was the flying bit, you know, as far <laughs> as, you know, I, I really like, you know, I always liked the idea of that too. And like, I think that the books were always diminishing returns as they continued. And that's mm -hmm. from the third book. I, I think that that is one of the funny, like really funny bits from the third book. Um, but yeah, I mean, as far as the rest of it, I mean, it really, as long as, like what Keith and Brian were saying, as long as you have people on the writing side and the directing side that really get it, you know, I mean, I think it's going to be fine because I don't want to say too much that this has to be this way or that has to be that way because it has changed, you mm -hmm. know, over time. And, and just the sort of general idea of 42, you know, in addition to the earth blowing up in the beginning, but that sort of idea of the ultimate answer, the ultimate question, all that's all going to play together somehow, but you can mix it up. I mean, the order changes sometimes, even when they have the same events in the different media. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you, you can play with it all kinds of different ways. You can add things, subtract things, whatever. But I think those are kind of like the, the quintessential elements. And like I say, I, I personally would end it the way that the show ends it though. And, and how the second book ended, which is just ended on that very perfect, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, this is, this is, you know, it's all been screwed up. It's all been for nothing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Robin the hat. Um, well, a couple of things I'd love to see. I'd love to see a, a hula mm. uh, the super tone say the color blue. Sorry there, uh, Rob. <laughs> uh, I would also uh, love to see the total perspective vortex yeah. that we got from the second book. I would love to see that scene. Uh, but more um, from a, a show running standpoint, um, uh, I would love to see Neil Gaiman be the showrunner. He did such an amazing job on Good Omens. Uh, uh, plus, like everyone else has said so far, he gets it. And uh, I think that if they don't have Neil Gaiman as a showrunner, that they are missing a prime opportunity. Neil's Neil's first um, major work was uh, uh, a, a book on Douglas Adams. Back I have it. Yeah, it was really yeah. good. Yeah, that's a great point. All right, Levy, what about you? You know, I think the the one thing about this is that it's finally gotten a format that works for it. I mean, the six episode sort of format for the original series worked really well. But having a streaming thing where it's like they don't have to tell whoever the showrunner is or the writers, you're playing a short game here. They can tell the story they want us to tell. Now, the problem is when you have that big of a of a, of a, of a, a thing to paint on, when do you stop? You know, I think where they do the breaks for the seasons and stuff is going to be interesting. Do they do more than one season? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of that's going to be intriguing. I really I want them to keep you know, a lot of what I'm going to call the aesthetics of it. I want them to keep the music good. I want the, the guide to look like, I mean, the way that the, the thing is the, the way that the guide is printed on the screen is so perfect that I almost want it to be kind of a retro looking thing and not this like too future thing. I don't want it to get too full of itself with cool visuals, right. um, which is, which I can understand you know, all this technology, you know, I want to see like, the plant falling. I want to see the dolphins, but I, I want to see them. I don't want to see them looking cool. I want to see it in a way that's creative. I want some of the magic that happens when I read the book uh, or even the graphic novel just came out or um, watch the TV show. I want the magic that's still in my head to still be there with the TV show because that's the one great thing about all the versions is they still have this like in your what you what you put in your head with it is so great. It's it's mm -hmm. it, that's the beauty of it. And besides the wordsmith, the, the wordsmithness of it is the visuals it creates for the person who sees it. Um, I just I, I don't want them to sacrifice the art and of the humor and the way that it uses language for effects. That's my biggest scare. Um, Absolutely. I could not agree with you anymore. I mean, I know one of my biggest complaints about the movie is that the way the guide looked yeah. was very muted in color. And in the TV series, it's very vibrant. It's yeah. very active. There's more mm -hmm. stuff going on with it. So I hope that they hold on to that. So um, I I, use, just, they've got to use Journey of the Sorcerer also. They've got to oh, use yeah, yeah. Right. definitely. Right. So we're unfortunately out of time, and I know we could spend a lifetime talking about this, but um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the TV series, 40th anniversary, happy birthday. We are so excited. It was an amazing, amazing show. You should go watch it if you're a fan of all things Hitchhiker. It is um, thank you. on Amazon Prime at the moment, by the way. 
Awesome. Thanks for doing Which may that. still be true by the time people watch this. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. If not, and, where, where? <laughs> uh, well, thank you guys so much for being here. We cannot thank you enough for your time and joining us and talking about um, this panel for Dragon Con. And um, just real quick, let's go around. Um, Keith, where can people find you? Uh, if you go to decandido.net, that's uh, my last name, decandido.net. Uh, you can find that that will lead you to all the various different places you can cyber stalk me um, or just search my name on Google. I'm literally the only Keith DeCandido in the, in the world. Nice. <laughs> and Brian, where can people find you? I am on British Invaders, the podcast all about British science fiction television, uh, BritishInvaders.com where we have covered something like 150 plus uh, British sci-fi shows over the last 14 years now. It's amazing. Okay, and Nathan, where can everybody find you? Uh, yeah, you can find me and my show at 42cast.com. I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at 42cast, and the 42cast can be found at anywhere, basically, that you can find podcasts. Nice. And Levy, what about you? Uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Insta, as the kids say, um, <laughs> all under my name. Um, needcoffee.com, anglotopia.net, and um, just kind of Google, because there's a lot of other crap in there. <laughs> nice. And um, Robin the Hat, where can people um, find uh, the Brit Track? Well, thanks for uh, uh, not asking me where I can be found, because I can be found <laughs> between these two people right here and over this guy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the Brit Track can be found in several places. We are on Facebook at the at the Brit Track at Dragon Con. We are also uh, on Twitter at Brit Track, and we are on uh, the uh, Instagrams at DC Brit Track. Yes, I said Instagrams because I know how you kids do with your rocks and rolling and you know your your alcohol and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, come and check us out. Facebook very active and. Uh, you know, Belgium. That's all I gotta say. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you, DragonCon, for watching. You can find us um, in various different places that Rob mentioned. Well, thank you again, and everybody have a wonderful evening or afternoon don't when this panic. airs. So and don't long, thanks for all the panic. Panic. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, everybody.